Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Renee Vigno, a structural engineer and principal with Pharrell Alcesser Engineers in San Francisco about the preservation and protection of historic landmark structures. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Renee. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by Collier's Engineering and Design. Collier's Engineering and Design is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with over 1,800 employees in 63 offices nationwide and growing fast. Collier's Engineering and Design maintains an internal culture that is nurtured through the promotion of integrity, collaboration, and socialization. Their employees enjoy hybrid work environments, continuous career advancement, health and wellness offerings, and programs and projects that have a positive impact on society. Collier's Engineering and Design stays on the cutting edge of technology and their entrepreneurial approach to expansion provides personal and professional development opportunities across the firm. Leadership's dedication to the well-being of their employees and their families is demonstrated throughout the wide range of benefits and programs available to them. For more information, visit the career page on their website at colliersengineering.com. Renee, first, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. Now, could you tell us in your own words what you do on a day-to-day basis with Pharrell and El Cessner? Yes. Uh, so I am a principal at Pharrell El Cessner. I've been with the company for 20-something years now and uh, worked my way up <laughs> to principal. Um, uh, so for a long time, I just worked on projects and, and worked at a higher level on projects. And now I've actually transitioned where I half work on projects and I half help manage the firm itself as our COO. Uh, so it's been a whole new opportunity to learn new things. Uh, and it's been really uh, interesting and challenging in its own way. Awesome. Uh, what we're going to talk about a uh preserving historic uh, buildings on this episode. I'm really excited about that. Could you tell us uh, what drew you into that or how you got involved into that, uh, I guess, niche in structural engineering? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've always really liked history uh, just in general. I read a lot of history books. And so working on retrofits of a historic building kind of brings together what I kind of just kind of like, and then my passion and skill in engineering. And uh, it's just a really nice synergy. Um, And I'd say, um, you know, there's something really neat about rolling open an old set of drawings uh, that were, I mean, these days it would probably be a scan actually, but (laughs) back when I started my career, you'd actually roll open this old set of drawings that might even be on linen and it's hand drawn by someone. It must've taken them weeks to, to draw just one drawing. And it's very artistic. Uh, it's just really an experience to, to see what was done a hundred years ago or more uh, in construction. And then also just getting to walk through a building and getting to walk into all those areas that the general public might not be able to go. And you get to get to comb through everything and go through the little hidden doors and, and see every facet of the building and, and, uh, and see the, the craftsmanship that, uh, that a lot of workers had back then. Uh, not that we don't have good workers these days, but, uh, but the time that they used to take uh, to really create amazing details in a building uh, is just something I really enjoy. Yeah, and I think a lot of our listeners, especially if they have anything to do with any sort of historical preservation work, I remember when I was um, back before I was in my current position, I worked in Alabama for a consulting firm, and Mm -hmm. we did um, phase one evaluation reports where you have to look at the history of a site. Um, And I remember we did one where we also did testing for volatile chemicals and construction just general construction. So you're led that sort of thing. And I remember it was a historical building. It, the floors had completely rotted. So you were walking on planks that were about like 
16 inches wide yeah. and we were having to go and test like the windowsills, but it was so interesting because it was one of the few projects that we had that had like a basement and in the basement, mm-hmm. you could see all the way to the attic, which was about three stories up, three stories up, oh. but it was just so interesting walking on planks across the joists around the entire time (laughs) (laughs) maybe dodging a pigeon or two or whatever else Uh, yeah I want to say there was like a dead crow in Uh, the fireplace and I was like nope 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 (laughs) (laughs) exactly if you don't look at it it's not there (laughs) exactly so for you um when you're starting one of these projects how do you start um you know, there's there's a lots of things to to do at right when out of the gate. I mean, first you grab every last drawing you can, even if it's mechanical and has nothing to do with structure. You grab it because it might show you something. And so a lot of times there's going to be incomplete sets. Even half of the drawing might be gone. You know uh, that it, it it fell away over time. And so it's a real treasure hunt where you're trying to to look at a, an old architectural drawing or a structural or even mechanical and kind of piece together what the, the building actually is. Um, and actually what's been helpful over the years is, is some of these buildings have pretty good photography from when they were built, um, even in the you know, early 1900s, late 1800s, you can get some pretty good photos. And that has helped us actually understand say a cladding system because you see it being built and you go, oh, that's what they were doing, you know, and, and that's that's how it actually came together. Um, that has been very interesting and helpful. I think, um, obviously, visiting the building and getting through as much as you can, taking uh, as many pictures as your phone will hold, because you're going to always think, why didn't I take that one more angle and one more picture to like refer to later? Um, and then, at, and then at that point, you know, what materials do I have, right? So maybe you have drawings that say, oh, it's 3,000 pound concrete or, or 40 KSI steel, but sometimes you don't, don't really have anything. And uh, if you've ever touched ASC 41, it has a whole rundown of how you should test materials, but, uh, you know, taking cores, taking some rebar and pull testing it, uh, but even getting into brick tests, um, stone tests. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you can do these days. And then also just laser scanning is very helpful. Uh, it, it, maybe it's, it's sometimes more the architect, but it could even be for, for the engineer uh, getting a laser scan and bringing that into a 3D model and being able to see where things are laying out. Uh, uh, th- those are all things that keep you busy right out of the gate when you haven't even really started yet. That's really cool. I know um, in Houston, they're doing a lot of old uh, retrofits of some of the existing towers that were out there. And it was real Mm. unfortunate because a lot of them kept their plan sets in the basements. (laughs) And if you didn't know, Houston floods. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's not good at all. (laughs) And I remember there was a big, Uh, um, I forget when it was, but they did like a huge push to like get all of those buildings plan sets um, digitalized in some yeah. manner to help right. prevent that. But I knew that was yeah. a big issue <laughs> yeah. or they would, you're right. They would go missing. There was one that I did, um, that I supported at one point and like, it was a 26 story tower mm. and it was made of this interesting, very, very interesting historic tile. And they only had records of 13 floors. Yeah. Don't know right. what happened to the other <laughs> others. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes the old drawings aren't even right. I mean, you'll you'll look at them and say, wait, this doesn't match what I'm seeing. <laughs> and then you'll notice there's another revision and and you have to really keep chasing. Uh, we we worked on a building, uh, the Oregon Supreme Court recently, and it turned out the floor was made out of uh, was made out of tile. Like that was the structure of the floor. Uh, it was this old tile floor system, uh, which we had never seen. And we researched and, and it turns out it's actually quite good, but <laughs> you learn something new every time. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned, I think you're based in San Francisco. So you also have to take into account seismic. I mean, I'm, 
And I would assume, um, yeah. you know, the o- my only reference to San Francisco is watching Full House. So you'll have to forgive me. But <laughs> <laughs> how, like, what are what are some of the challenges in retrofitting historical properties in areas of seismic? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of historic buildings are built with kind of heavy, big, heavy materials, you know, like uh, brick, unreinforced brick, and the unre- focus on the unreinforced part. Um, <laughs> you can have concrete, but we, we would call it non-ductile concrete because they didn't put enough rebar in it. So it, it's, it's brittle. Uh, there's hollow clay tiles. So instead of um, using metal studs as partitions, they used to build partitions out of brittle tile called hollow clay tile, which is really hazardous. Um, and you can have terracotta, you can have stone. I mean, you name it, there's all these really heavy, brittle materials all over these buildings. And some, some of them have one of every type I just mentioned. Uh, the, the Oregon State Capitol we're working on has every single one of those. And uh, so what, what happens is you have all these heavy materials, they make the building much heavier and your seismic force is directly related to how heavy you are. And so you're, now the fact that it's heavier makes more force to resist. And then these materials though, if they move even a quarter inch, they start cracking and, and you know, they're just extremely brittle. So you have this really tough situation of a lot of mass and you can't really move it too much, but your force is high. And so you're really struggling to figure out how to get structure in here to make it work. Um, so you, you have to often put in a very robust system, uh, a lot of times with concrete, just because it's more compatibly stiff with what you're dealing with. And, uh, but because the forces are so high, the walls get very big and all of a sudden your, your, your walls are taking over and they're, you know, it, it's hard to fit them behind things, you know, they're, they're too thick. And so now you're, you're kind of ruining the very history you're trying to preserve because you're having to put in all this big structure. So it's been a real, uh, it gets to be a real challenge. Like how do you get it in there and still preserve what everyone wants to see? Yeah, that's, uh, I haven't worked on, I've worked on smaller ones, but from historic big preservation projects like that, that, yeah, I've always thought about those and that would be tough because like you were saying, you already have all of the parameters that you can't really change. And like you were saying, preserving the past as a, you know, as a structural engineer with these landmark structures, how do you do that without ruining what, uh, what people have come to see or what's really significant aspects of the building? And, uh, and I'm, yeah, I've, it's really interesting to see what structural engineers come up with. Uh, I think one of the things I wanted to discuss about is uh, the base isolation technology. Could you talk uh, talk to us a little bit about that for structural engineers that maybe aren't too familiar with it and how you've used base isolation technology in your retrofits for historic buildings? Yeah, sure. Uh, so base isolation is in its simplest form, it's basically separating the building from the ground laterally so that when the ground shakes back and forth really violently, the isolators filter that out and the building only feels uh, some fraction of what the earthquake's actually, uh, the earthquake energy that's actually in there. So that uh, not only reduces the force that the building feels, but it also reduces how much it moves. So it's, it's solving both of your problems, you know, you have, you have, if you have a bigger force, you have to put in bigger structure so that you don't move so much. Um, but if you have a technology that can reduce the force and reduce the movement in your building at the same time, then you're really going in the right direction quickly. And you can really reduce the structure that you have to put in. So instead of the entire building swaying back and forth, floor to floor from ground to roof, you're concentrating that movement in the basement or in in the lowest uh, level where you put the isolation. 
and the entire building is swaying back and forth, but from its first floor to its roof, it's moving very little. Uh, so the, it's just translating the whole building. So all that energy that was taking uh, the building for a ride and cracking and destroying it is now being used to move the entire building side to side instead. And so you're putting all your effort into getting the building on these isolators so that the structure you need above the isolators is a lot smaller. And so when we've had this problem where we like, we're gonna need shear walls around this entire brick building in order to, to meet the requirements, now the force has gone down by a factor of five to 10. And we can put in just some targeted smaller walls and hide it behind the historic finishes and preserve the building that we wanted to preserve and hide all the engineering in the basement where <laughs> no one wants to go anyway. And, and that is the real uh, magic of it. It's not so much in, in, in other uh, buildings, isolation may be used to hit some high performance level where you really need uh, to hit a very low acceleration or, or to protect some artwork or, or something like that. Um, but for historic buildings, it's really about reducing the amount of structure you need to insert in the historic spaces. Yeah, and that's some great information. And, you know, I don't have a whole lot. I, I live in Texas, so I don't have a whole lot of, of experience with base isolation and what it does. You know, the way that, you know, for a historic building, I, of course, always think, you know, it's already on its foundation. It's already connected to the foundation. How do you put in a base isolation system with historic buildings? Do you just, I mean, I feel like we've all seen the video where they just like pick up the building. Yeah, it seems like you got to pick it, up the building. <laughs> and then move <laughs> it back like and set it back down when they replace the foundation. Like, yeah. what, are, what are some of the challenges that you see in utilizing base isolation for historic buildings. Yeah, that, that you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you just flip the isolator under there, right? <laughs> um, and it, and it's even it's even more difficult because of what I said before about the building being so heavy and so brittle, right? So not only are we trying to quickly put a new support under, but we have to do it very carefully because. We don't want to destroy the building in the process of trying to save it, right? So uh, what we've done over the years is develop different methods where we're using active jacking to prevent movement. So uh, that it can take many forms. Uh, sometimes it's inserting needle beams through, say, a wall at some spacing, and then those needle beams can be on jacks and then you can jack up the wall at various points and then completely remove the foundation under it, put a new one, put isolators, and then connect it all back up. Um, and when, as, as it's gotten uh, more challenging with larger pieces of structure, like uh, at the uh, Utah State Capitol that I worked on, there was a massive dome to the building and it came down on these big towers that landed on a footing the size of a house. You know, it, it was this massive structure. And we're like, how are we gonna get wow. an isolator <laughs> underneath it? And the, the right answer was not to try to go underneath, but to, to try to use the footing uh, along with some new concrete beams on the side to turn it into a load transfer element and put the new footing and the isolators outside of the old footing. And then by using jacking and then post-tensioning that system, you transfer the load from where it was landing first over to where you want it to be. But the key is using, like I said, post-tensioning and jacking to not allow the building to, to sag when it wants to get the load over to the new place. You want to actively get it there so that the building never knows what happened. That's our goal, is that the building really just never knows what you did to it. That is so interesting. I, it reminds me, I worked on a project in Houston one time where they did, they were expanding the footers out 
and increasing the size because they were doing a huge retrofit where they were adding like three floors to the very top. But I remember them having to do the, it was like this odd cross jack system. Mm -hmm. And I remember I left before they fully implemented it and lifted the building up, but it was just interesting to hear them talk about it. But it was a similar situation where they were trying to adjust the load to almost the supporting beams and then adjust it back to once they had expanded out the existing footings. Yeah, it's, it, it, it often is a different system every time we have a project. Uh, right now we're working on a retrofit of the, the uh, Salt Lake Temple in uh, Salt Lake City for uh, the Mormon Church. And that is such a heavy building. It's, it's made out of solid granite. It's almost uh, oh built, like a, it's built like a, a castle. You know, the walls are <laughs> castle. six feet thick. It's really, uh, it's really something. But we had to come up with a whole new way of transferring load be just because of the, the, the sheer size and weight of the building and we've worked uh, with a, a mining technology to get pipes inserted under the foundation to allow us to put in some cables some post tensioning cables and do a similar uh, outrigger uh, load transfer system I'm, I'm i'm horribly simplifying what's very complicated but <laughs> it's uh it, it's it's it, that's what's interesting about these jobs is it's never the same uh, you're, you're constantly challenging yourself and trying to invent something new to make things work. Uh, and, and that's what really uh, gets me up in the morning. That's really cool. Uh, I imagine the coordination that goes on between there, between you, the contractors, uh, and even apparently the mining technology and what technologies <laughs> that can be used. Um, yeah, like you're digging underground or, or making a giant hole in the ground without trying to disturb the building. Uh, definitely some challenges there. Uh, I did want to talk about the retrofitting of the Memorial Stadium at UC Berkeley. Could you talk about uh, some of the challenges that you overcame in that project? Yeah, that, that was a, a very interesting project for us. Um, it, it's a, it, it started as a very large, uh, again, non-ductile concrete, meaning the concrete basically doesn't have enough rebar in it and is very brittle. Um, a big non-ductile concrete structure sitting right on an active earthquake fault uh, that runs right down uh, the field, basically from end zone to end zone. Um, so we had two main problems. I mean, even without the fault, this massive non-ductile concrete building is a big problem. And, and uh, we ended up focusing on the, the exterior wall, which was the really marquee kind of visual component that everyone wanted to preserve and, and used um, new structure behind it to, to save that in place and preserve it uh, so that you would still have the look of the old stadium. Uh, but the, the fault running down the field was a, a real mind bender. Um, how do you deal with movements of, uh, you know, six feet, or maybe it could be 12 feet, who knows, you know, the, 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 there's estimates of, that, that we designed to, but the scheme we, we worked on, essentially, we wanted to make sure it would work for, for double what we thought, because who can really predict what an earthquake is going to do when it comes down to that. Uh, so we ended up taking the parts of the stadium that were right over the fault and creating these bunker like structures that sat on top of the fault, but were not connected down with piles or anything, or just a, a mat foundation. And it allowed those parts of the building to slide and tilt and rotate and shift however they needed in, in response to what the ground was doing and not try to fight the movement, but just move with it and just put large gaps uh, around those parts of the building so that if they had to move, they can move. And, and uh, that ended up being really the best way of dealing with the movement. And it, it was a really a great experience for me because we were at UC Berkeley with some of the foremost experts in seismic engineering and in geotechnic or geoseismic engineering. 
And they were showing us all these pictures from past earthquakes of here's what happened to this building in a fault in an earthquake when a, when a fault went right through it, you know, and, and here's one that actually did pretty well and the fault went right through it. And we learned about how to do it. And then we did it right there. Um, so uh, it was just a, a, a one of a kind experience uh, to work on that project. Yeah. What a problem, right? Like, okay, you got this building on top of a fault. How do you prevent it from not splitting <laughs> the fault wants to split? And, and it seems like you guys kind of put, um, like you were saying, these structures that were kind of isolated uh, underneath the, the parts of the building that were under the fault. And that allowed the fault to move, but it wouldn't transfer all of that energy through the building to, to crack it in half, essentially. Yeah, just the parts that were right over could just could just move, you know, instead of trying to fight it and resist load that it would never be able to resist, <laughs> you know, just let it move and 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 shift in response. And then you're 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 not going to get these large forces that you would otherwise. Um, it, it, it now when the earthquake, if, if an earthquake like that ever happens, of course, the building will have moved. <laughs> and you can't really move it back. Uh, the, the Pacific plate is now north relative to the <laughs> North American plate and you can't put it back. So uh, that would be a whole nother project to, to redesign the stadium with a shift in it. <laughs> yeah, but one thing you mentioned is like how they had the pictures already of certain mm, buildings or projects that had been able to resist that sort of movement and others that yeah. hadn't. I would be curious to kind of know more what the timeline of those, like what method of construction, because I'm not super familiar with UC Berkeley, but I'm assuming it's a historical campus. What, yeah. what year building was built that has been the most resistant to the most, I guess, the most amount of earthquake events? Yeah, you know, the, the, the campus really hasn't felt uh, the big one that we designed for um, the the Hayward Fault, which was the one right through the stadium, really had its largest last event in the mid 1800s, and uh, UC Berkeley wasn't there yet. So uh, it actually turned uh, this this whole hill. It moved a whole hill up in the path of a stream and created this valley during that you know over the years of of geologic movement, and it it created this bowl that they thought, wow, this would be a great place for a stadium. Like half the, <laughs> half the bowl's already there. And it turned out there was a reason that it was a bowl is because the fault made it that way. Um, but uh, yeah, the, you know, we've, we've made uh, quite a living as a firm, uh, as, as well as other firms in the Bay Area of helping the campus retrofit and improve their buildings over time. Um, and, and it's not that they haven't ever felt an earthquake, uh, when the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake happened here in 89, there was definitely motion over in, at, at the campus, but it hasn't gotten that direct hit that uh, the Hayward Fault would bring. And that's, that's what uh, the campus really focuses on. Uh, and I'm actually serve on the seismic review committee on campus to help uh, review designs and make sure they're really being careful and thinking through the earthquake hazard. Yeah, that's great. So, so for do you mean for the students or review for designs in San Francisco or around the campus in general? So that's uh, we're reviewing designs for buildings on campus or retrofits okay. of building on on campus. Uh, so we uh, we go in front of that committee many times as a firm because we do work there, and I at some point was asked to join the committee. <laughs> uh, so sometimes I, have to I think this is what myself. happens when you do a really good job. <laughs> so like you should review for us all the time. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, it sounds as though you've had a pretty extended career, especially around this historical preservation. You know, what are some things that engineers can do to help preserve and protect historical sites? I know sometimes, especially around preservation, it is um, association led or it may be jurisdictionally led. Uh, I, I'm from Alabama. Our 
our historical preservation um, guidelines are fairly loose, depending on who's purchased the building and how much they're willing to pay to change it. <laughs> yeah, um, right. But, you know, a lot of engineers do hold historical sites and historical construction as a very valuable, it's very valuable to know how they've performed over the years. So what are your thoughts on things engineers can do just in their day to day to help? Yeah, I think, you know, when I think of that, I think more about how you approach a, a, an existing building or a historic building. Um, you know, if you do new buildings, most of the time you have a certain way of thinking and, and uh, the code is, is laid out uh, for newer buildings, honestly, uh, and, and that you can almost use the code as somewhat of a guidebook of, well, I need to do this and then this and then this and follow this process. And uh, you, need, you do need to check things in the code for a historic building, but, but having a mindset of, of getting outside of that box and thinking more creatively, like, okay, that's what we would normally do, but how could we do something in this building that would preserve it? And we wouldn't have to blow out, you know, this beautiful plaster, uh, you know, ornate plaster wall uh, to put in some structure behind it. Uh, maybe we can center core the existing wall from the top and not have to move that uh, plaster and remove and replace it. Um, or, or, you know, maybe we can transfer load above and get around this. So it's, it's, it's thinking at a different level than you're used to maybe of changing load paths or, or using a new, a new or just a different technology to get around a problem that is in front of you. Uh, it, it's a mindset and it, it takes practice. You know, you don't learn it day one. You have to work with others who've done it. And then you start learning some of the tricks of the trade and, and, and tuning your eye to how can we change the way we do things. So if you have that mindset, then architects might be more willing to you know, use you and say, you have the abilities to preserve a building like this and yet also make it modern enough that we have sprinkler systems and you know, basic <laughs> safety and things like that. Um, and, and if there are more engineers out there who are willing to do that and have the skills to do that, then we can save more of these old buildings. Uh, and I, I think that's the, the best thing to do, honestly. Yeah, very, very cool. Like you were saying, uh, new buildings, for the most part, there's that guidebook guideline. But with retrofits, like you were saying, with all these different projects, there's always different problems in that that forces you as an engineer to kind of go off of the more creative path I would, I'm thinking of where you kind of have to think differently on how to solve these problems that aren't typical because they're, they're not right. typical buildings. Each, each one of them is different. Um, and to end off here, I had two questions. Um, the first one for someone looking to get out, I've always wondered for someone, for the students that want to get into uh, historical preservation in terms of their analysis and their studies at school and maybe what their classes they're taking, would it, it, would it be heavily involved in terms of the um, performance-based design in terms of seismic and knowing how to do those types of analysis? Or is it still kind of a simple calcs and figuring out different ways or what type of analysis is involved in, in these retrofits? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and and something that uh, is is key to these projects, which I hadn't mentioned so far, is is the analysis piece. Uh, if you use a simple method of analysis, you're going to get a more conservative structure, and that's just the way the code is set up. Um, because yeah. in order to make a simple design process, you have to be conservative. Uh, but the more complex you get, the more you account for uh, actual behavior of structures at a deeper and deeper level, the more benefit you can give that structure. And uh, sometimes you can spend, you know, maybe twice your design fee, but end up with half the retrofit 
and the owner will typically be pretty happy with you if you can do that. They'll, they won't mind paying you more money if your more in-depth analysis can actually save them a whole bunch of time and effort in the field. Uh, it's a small price to pay up front. So yeah, if, if you're interested in that, really do take, uh, take note of those classes or those seminars if you're already working um, that go in depth on nonlinear analysis and performance-based design. If you can give the structure the more of a, a detailed benefit of what it can provide, then you're going a long way toward preserving historic buildings for sure. Very cool. Did you have any last uh, career advice for structural engineers in general? Well, you know, for me, it's about staying curious um, and, and always wanting to learn more. Uh, you, when you start, you feel like you know nothing um, and it takes years, maybe up to five years for you to feel like, okay, I kind of know a little bit what I'm doing now. Um, and, and that's a good feeling and you need that. But you want to keep feeling like I got to learn this new thing. I got to learn this other thing. And, I, and I'm curious, like, well, how does that work? You know, and, and, and don't settle into, okay, now I know enough and I can just do this job. Um, keep pushing because it's what makes this job interesting is to do things like that. And, you know, there's a lot of new technologies that have come along over the, the years that I've been doing this. There were still hand drafters when I started. <laughs> now there's, <laughs> now it's all 3D modeling, right? It's, it's, it's changed and who knows what it'll be in 20 years from now. Um, but uh, you want to embrace those things because you're going to, well, first of all, it's interesting to most people to do that, but you're, you'll jump ahead of your competitors if the architect asks well how do you do this and you say well we do this and you know we we 3d model everything and and then you can show the architect and spin things and and cut them and show them exactly what's happening whereas someone else is trying to sketch on a piece of paper uh you know you're going to differentiate yourself so uh definitely embrace the new technologies uh, but you know in the end i'd say you know, this job is, is about doing good work and keeping good relationships. And that's, you know, as an engineer, you get a lot of chances to interact. You have your architects, your owners, uh, your contractors, subcontractors, other consultants. There's so many parties that you interact with. And if you earnestly try to like keep good relationships with all these people, and, you know, and, and do your best work, it'll come back to you. Uh, people will say, boy, I, I really like working with that engineer. They really get it. They listen to me when I ask them something and, and I wanna work with them again. I wanna work that firm again. Um, so if you, if you focus on those things, things like business development and the networking that, that you kind of maybe don't wanna do, it'll somewhat happen naturally if you have that, uh, that outlook of of just wanting to do good work and getting to know people well yeah great advice uh definitely agree with with those points uh i think one of the big things about our industry is yeah staying curious that's one of the things that that's uh really interesting about this career and definitely keeping relationships i think that goes for uh, engineers for the most part because uh <laughs> It's, I've yet to meet an engineer that doesn't talk to anybody and just sits in a corner and just like stares at a computer all day. At one point, yeah. they're going to have to the interact full with... The keyboard warrior. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you're isolated. You're, yeah. you're going to be talking to your teammates and then eventually right. clients, contractors. So, Yeah, and it turns out to me to be the, the best part of the job, honestly, you know, is all those interactions. Definitely. Yeah. And I can tell, I mean, I can understand why you were moved up to principal because you explained by base isolation in probably the most clear terms as someone who doesn't come from that sort of industry where that's relevant to me. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably the clearest I've ever had it explained to me. And so now I understand completely. Well, good, good. <laughs> now tell everyone to use it. 
<laughs> I know, right? Unfortunately, I have very little. Oh, that's a whole uh, other conversation. <laughs> I'd want to get into. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other podcast. But... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll be another one. I got some thoughts on that as well. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much, Renee. Uh, definitely learned a lot, and this was a really interesting topic. Yeah, great. It was great to talk with you guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Renee. Until next time. All right. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 80, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.